This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon. Viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dogs, spelled D-A-W-G, find our podcast, and subscribe. Well, today we have a, a great show. This is actually somebody who I just definitely, his bio intrigues me and it sounds like a heck of a nice guy. And on top of that, uh, he loves Haiti. And so it definitely uh, touched uh, my heart, uh, just the great stuff he's doing over there. But this is uh, Frank McKinney. Frank McKinney is a real estate artist, five-time international best-selling author, superhero meets Robin Hood, philanthropic capitalist, ultra-marathoner, actor, and visionary who sees opportunities and creates markets where none existed before. Now, Frank creates real estate markets where others fear to tread. He has built oceanfront spec homes, homes that are built without a buyer, valued in the tens of millions of dollars, sh shattering price records with each new project. Project. Frank started with a $50,000 fixer upper home and climbed all the way to 50 million oceanfront mansion. Frank's latest creation, his micro mansion. McKinney's total new concept in ultra high end homes has was just unveiled and is taking the luxury real estate world by storm. Frank spends quite a bit of his time, not only on, on real estate things, but in the philanthropic area and uh, specifically his Caring House Project Foundation, which uh, is something that just definitely touched my heart, a nonprofit 501c3 organization that provides housing and self-sustaining existence for homeless families, primarily in Haiti and also here in the U.S. By the end of 2016, a total of 10,400 plus people will have been sheltered in Haiti alone because of his organization, and thousands more are alive because of their efforts. So I am really thrilled to get a chance to welcome Frank McKinney. Frank, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Bill, I've made it. <laughs> I have made it. I am an old dog and I'm on a, re a real estate podcast, something I started just after leaving my teens, a business, and now I qualify for the Old Dogs ARP card. I'm honored. Well, I I just wish I would have looked half your good at your age. You look like David Lee Roth, okay, in the peak of Van Halen success. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe back then, not now. I don't think David Lee Roth has much hair left. But uh, at, least, at least I have yeah. some. I, I got actually I got that's one thing I was blessed with. But I it's fun. I'm coming to you and your and your listeners from my oceanfront treehouse today. So that's why maybe we have a little audio trouble. I work from a treehouse surrounded by twelve windows looking out at the Atlantic Ocean. If this was television, I'd swing the the camera around and show you i'm looking at this beautiful azure blue ocean 
and uh, and I'm going to spend the next half an hour with you and your listeners from my oceanfront treehouse. Oh man, you're killing me. That sounds like such a blast. My wife and I were actually talking about this uh, the exact same thing. And there's a show on the home channels and about this guy that just goes out and builds treehouses for people. I I love these places. I mean, it's just I, I love that it's small, it's compact, and you're like you're like in the tree. I mean, I, I don't know that to me that sounds like a, a blast. A blast last i i'm jealous man i'm sitting well, here it, it, it's <laughs> actually where i wrote all five of my books from from the treehouse and, and i actually i had i hadn't written a book until i built this treehouse 15 years ago i've written five i'm actually starting on my sixth one uh, i design all the houses that you spoke of these oceanfront spec homes that i build upwards of well the old ones were mega houses upwards of 20,000 30,000 square feet and then my new concept really it's a, it's a evolution or revolution of the ultra high end market buyer a high end buyer wanting a you know less house and less square footage and so with this micro mansion concept i pioneered from the tree house so anyway let's get to the meat of it let's let's teach your buyers how to make some money in real estate <laughs> well great well uh, you know I, I you're already you know you got my curiosity going here you're a fascinating character i mean uh, all those things you know, actor and you name it it sounds like you've done it uh, maybe you could just give us just a, a you know brief little rundown on your background where you came from and uh, how you got into this crazy world of real estate Corn-fed country boy from Indiana. I, I left high school, my fourth high school in four years after being kicked out of the first three with a 1.8 grade point average. I landed in Florida when I was 18 with no hope of pursuing a formal or higher education, a $50 bill and everything I owned in a duffel bag. But being in South Florida, the land of opportunity and watching Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous on TV at night, which you are my age, so you'll remember that program very well. <laughs> With uh, champagne dreams and, <laughs> and caviar wishes and champagne dreams. Absolutely, All, everybody listening to this that, that, that is around, you know, closer along as you and I've been around, will remember that program. Anyway, I watched it on TV at night, uh, Bill, and but yet I watched uh, people living it during the day here in South Florida. I was a maintenance worker on a golf course digging sand traps, but I was around affluence. I was around people who seemed to have do nothing more than play golf all morning and tennis in the afternoon. I became a tennis instructor. I was a really good tennis player as a young boy, so I became a tennis instructor, and I was earning a very good living, a six-figure-a-year living in my my late teens. Actually, before I turned 20, I was making $100,000 a year teaching tennis. Gee whiz, man. Well, but there was a limit. There was a limit. You know, I was baking out there in the hot sun eight to 10 hours a day, and there was a limit to how much I was going to make. Really, I had maxed out my earning potential as a tennis instructor, more or less, by the age of, you know, my early 20s. So most of the people, many of the people I, I taught tennis to were not born real estate investors. They had they had a nine to five, just like most of the people listening to your podcast, but they took their discretionary income, the money left over after paying bills and putting food on the table, and they invested in real estate. And, and maybe they were a doctor, a lawyer, or inventor, or whatever, wh wherever else they were from nine to five, but their fortune was built on real estate, buy real estate. And and I earned my PhD in entrepreneurship, really my master's in real estate on the tennis court, teaching these people, well, they would pay for an hour long tennis lesson, but, but I made sure after 45 minutes, they were too tired to finish. They sat down, I picked their brains for 15 minutes at a time over a two to three year span. I realized real estate was what got them there. Real estate, what was gonna get me off the tennis court and into you know, a, a career that I could actually make a fortune and, and, and build a legacy from. And now, and I can say this on your program, now 30 years later, I've been at it since 1987. I did my first flip in 1987. Now, you know, since 1992, all we've done is build houses on, on the ocean, on speculation. I've done 42 houses on the ocean since 1992. That's not a lot, really, if you think about it. It's a house and a half over 25 years. But we our average selling price is $14.4 million, and, um, you know, it's like artistry. It is artistry created – three-dimensional artistry created on a sun-drenched canvas known as the Atlantic Ocean here in South Florida. So that's that's my – professional highest calling that God gifted me with is building these houses, designing these houses, furnishing these houses, down to the gold-plated toothbrush in the bathroom, linens on the beds and towels in the closet. And then when we sell them, you know, Bill, we, we take some of the proceeds. And, and when I say we, my wife and I, we've been married 27 years. We go to Haiti and we build these self-sufficient villages over in the country that you're very familiar with. 
Wow. 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 <laughs> that's, that's what an amazing story. Gee whiz. I mean, how did you, I mean, you got into obviously designing homes. You're doing all this stuff. You don't have an architectural background. You just learned it as you went along. Well, God has given everybody on your podcast a professional highest calling, as defined by me as being you, the listener, being a little bit better than most at doing something that puts food on the table. That is my definition of your professional highest calling. So if you work at it long enough, and I, I realized at a pretty early age that I was good at this craft of real estate, not job, not business not bottom line driven, but the craft of real estate. And I implore everybody who gets into the business or who is already in, in the business and some of the old dogs on the, on the program here listening to the podcast, take an artist approach to the craft of real estate. Even if you're a buy and hold person, it doesn't matter. And what that does, Bill, is it builds your personal brand. The personal brand, Frank McKinney's personal brand is that of a sure, it wasn't my title, it was USA Today that actually called me a real estate artist and it stuck because I, 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 I can't sing, I can't, I can't play an instrument, I can't draw a stick figure to save my life, I can't sculpt a piece of clay or mold a piece of clay, but the artistry that I take to my, my, my real estate by way of this three-dimensional art built on the sun-drenched canvas, that is... That is something that God gifted me with, and of, of course I've honed it over all these years, and I've refined it, but I still – you know, the difference between an artist and a businessman, and, and fortunately for me, I'm both, but the primary distance, difference, if you're an artist, your pores ooze passion. So if you go to the paint store and you're a painter, you're not going to cut corners on and buy the cheapest paint, nor are you going to buy the cheapest brush, nor are you going to buy the cheapest canvas. You are – you're a passionate artist. Well – Real estate investors should take the same approach. Maybe I make a little bit less when it comes to my margins, but I have built a really good brand and reputation based upon taking an artist approach to what most people consider a bottom line driven business. Wow. A big question I have is like, you know, where where did you start? I mean, did you did you start with a real estate license? Did you look at a cliff and say, I see this castle there? And I mean, I mean, where 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 do you really start in doing what you what you've done? Well, starting back on that tennis court, and I learned, you know, from my 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 tennis students that Florida is still. 30 years later, a very transient community, meaning people are always, move, always moving in, moving out, also resulting in a very distressed real estate market, right? If there's people losing houses and foreclosure and sheriff sales and tax sales and short sales and all these different opportunities in South Florida. So I started extremely small. My first rehab and, and it wasn't even a you, the word flip wasn't even there it was just buy fix and sell was a 620 square foot two bedroom one bath crack house in a really bad part of town <laughs> that, Gee whiz. You know, that i bought for 30 grand i fixed up and i sold for 50 grand i made a seven thousand dollar profit it could have been monopoly money bill it didn't matter it, my concept was validated you know you, you know when you have a concept you put it into practice and it works you can be paid by monopoly money you're so thrilled that it actually works so that's where i started and you know what here's the other thing your listeners need to cue into for the first 5 years of my career i did not do a house undertake a project worth more than $100,000 so what happened was and, and for those of you who, who are avid readers, Malcolm Gladwell is a fantastic author. If you've read any of Gladwell's books, he's got a bunch of them out there, Blink and and Tipping Point and you know, so on and so forth, David versus Goliath, I think, or Goliath, I forget the name. But in Tipping Point or in Blink, he talks about to be an expert at anything in life, Bill, you gotta spend ten thousand hours. I did the math. Ten thousand hours is five years full time at a forty hour job. And for five years, from 1987 to 1992, I did not undertake a project worth more than 100 grand. So as I do a postmortem on the first part of my career, I became an expert at the craft of real estate over those five years. So it was, it was, it was a natural evolution to jump to a higher price point. And I didn't waste any time after those five years. I jumped from a $100,000 house to a $2.2 million house. I didn't do anything in between. I was ready. It just, you know, it was just one more zero. I mean, what's the big deal? The difference between a hundred thousand dollar house and a million dollar house 
is one more zero. Wow, but you're you're rehabbing. I mean, you, did you have any kind of construction background or anything? I mean, did you just how, how did you like take that, that first fifty thousand dollar house? So, so I really am. I'm ultra uh, observant. I, I observe uh, from from close. I observe from afar. Now I know enough about plumbing and electrical and structural, mechanical things to be dangerous. I am really back back then. Let's say, and even to this day, to be honest with you. But back then, I was really good at unskilled labor. I was the unskilled guy who would rip the roof off, who would lay the sod. I might be able to paint, but I'm not even that good at painting. I'm I'd, I'd probably better at prepping the wall. I mean, just the other day, fast forward to today, I broke two light bulbs trying to change a light in, in my upstairs uh, hanging light fixture. <laughs> that, that's how unskilled I am. I literally broke two. I had to laugh. I like, my, to Nilsa, my wife, honey, I can't do it. I can't even change a light bulb. But, but. That's that is a funny story, but but I watched all these contractors, these subs, these jack of all trades, these handymen in my early days with the early job, and I got good enough to know who was good, who was ripping me off, and who wasn't. I even still to this day have trouble reading a set of plans. I'm more three dimensional than I am two dimensional, but I realize what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And and now you know the biggest house we ever built was a thirty thousand square foot house that had eighteen bedrooms. 22 bathrooms and a 16 car garage. That was 20 years after, 20 some years after that first fifty fifty thousand dollar six hundred square foot house. Wow, wow! <laughs> and you and you are uh, intricately involved in the the design, the you know the the yeah you know, the, the from the initial architectural drawings to you know completion. Here's where my strength lies. I, I know what the ultra wealthy want before they know they want it. So so I am keenly involved and acutely aware of, of, of that early design phase where I do what I call a bubble diagram, which is basically taking a piece of paper and a pencil and bubbling out where certain rooms need to go, how big they need to be, how they need to be oriented toward the sunrise and the sunset on the ocean. I turn that whole bubble diagram drawing set over to an architect who puts it on a CAD system, you know, a computer assisted computer assisted design system and and they they do the draw the actual drawings that I submit for building permit but the design and the amenity package and just the the aura and the feeling of the house I have to know what the ultra wealthy want before they know they want it and and that's where the artistry comes in and and really speculating on what they're going to want in a house and for those of you listening when I say speculating I'll build I just finished my, this micro mansion which is a it, it's not as expensive as my prior houses but it's a you know it's a 4 million dollar house I don't know what I'm going to get paid bill and I haven't for 25 30 years so I better be right speculating on what the ultra wealthy want in these houses because we build them and like the field of dreams we hope they will come <laughs> man oh man well that kind of brings me to the next big question here is, is what was your biggest mistake in this process? Waiting too long to get started. Wow. Waiting, and I know that goes way back, but I will tell you the fear associated with leaving a six-figure-a-year job. As a 22-year-old making that kind of money on the tennis court, I was driving a Ferrari back then. I mean, I, I had the life. I came from the the, the, the golf or the, um, the, the corn field of Indiana down to Palm Beach, and I was living the lifestyles of the rich and famous within four years as a 22-year-old as a teaching tennis to beautiful women. I mean, it didn't get any better than that. But I had the biggest risk and the biggest mistake I made actually wasn't taking the risk sooner. So as I fast forward to, to today, and I, you know, I've written five books on four different genres, and the primary undercurrent that I see as an impediment to people's careers, especially careers in real estate, is giving in to the fear associated with the other four literal word, risk, the risk of getting into the real estate business. That that is something that can be overcome. It's something that I mean that that's the ma the biggest macro mistake. I've made a lot of micro mistakes, but the biggest macro mistake at the early stage was being too afraid to put my money where my mouth was and getting into the real estate. But it took me six months to pull the trigger at the beginning, and to me that was you know that was six months too long. Right. And conversely, what would you say is your biggest success? <laughs> that that would be it, right? Over <laughs> finally Listen, pulling the trigger, right? <laughs> to, well, to, to get a little philosophical, when when you consider when you consider 
the thought of taking a risk in life, the next sensation that we as humans feel is the other four-letter word, fear. But if that risk, if you inventory the risk you've thought about taking in your life, they're almost always associated with a big change or a big challenge in your life. could be relational, financial, spiritual, dietary. You go down the list. I mean, there's a lot of big changes or big challenges we consider. We think about taking a risk. And then we, when we're thinking about taking the risk, Bill, is when fear comes in. Once we take the risk, the fear goes away. It's amazing. I mean, the, the simple example would be, you know, jumping out of a plane or bungee jumping. You know, you're, you're, you're thinking about jumping and your heart's in your throat. But once you jump or once the roller coaster goes down that first hill, for those who haven't bungee jumped or, you know, jumped out of a plane, you've all been on a roller coaster. And the fear you feel going up that clankety, clankety, clank up to the top of the hill is overwhelming. That's the thought of what's ahead. Once that roller coaster drops, guess what goes away? The fear is replaced by exhilaration, by joy, by enjoyment. That's what we got to do when it comes to our business making decisions is get over the fear. Know that there's a big change or challenge ahead. I love being afraid. Frank McKinney's still afraid every day of his life, but I embrace the sensation. Oh, that's great. I um, I. I have to second that one. I, to me, that uh, that's really where the education starts for me is uh, when when I do face those uh, things and and then fall flat on my face. But that is one of the best ways I learn, and, it, and sometimes I have to fall many times. But I'll tell you, I'm learning. I'm learning in the process, and I and I really value that education because uh, you know that's. I, I think you can read all the books you want. You can you know go to the seminars and everything, but when it really comes down to it, it's uh, after you've taken that first step that you really, really start to learn. Well, so, something you mentioned early on that, it, it, you know, it's really, okay, let's roll up our sleeves and make some money here. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love, I love your approach. I love the energy here. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of take you to task on this. You know, the, the people listening 50 plus, uh, some are already working a W2 job, but they're coming, you know, they're thinking about retirement. And they're thinking about what, you know, what am I going to do? And really, is this money that I put aside as, uh, as my pension is whatever it may be going to be enough to really uh, do more than just allow us to survive? And for those that are already there that maybe are facing the realities of, gee whiz, you know, this nest egg, I don't know if it's going to last us as long as we want it to last. They're, they're all looking at the same same issue. And that is, you know, what? What can I do starting late in life here uh, in this real estate arena to be able to help us to have not just a uh, a retirement, but the retirement of our dreams, you know, to really be able to travel where you want, to do what you want, to go visit your kids or, or you know, if, where, no matter what part of the country they're in, to to help out, uh, you know, somebody that needs a down payment for their house or a, whatever it may be, or to build a, a village in Haiti, you know, whatever it may be. What kind of advice would you give to those that are, you know, to just kind of sitting there in that or evaluating that four letter word that you just mentioned, the risk, you know, what would you say to encourage them or, or to, you know, to give them some practical information to be able to, to take that step? So my, my advice might be a little counterintuitive and, and it might be a little bit risky for some, but follow me just for a second. Most people that you have on your podcast, Bill, I'm going to assume we're going to talk about a buy and hold strategy, a cash flow strategy. And there is nothing at all wrong with that. That is that is that is safe. It's advisable. It's it's something that you, you have you will have people and have had people on your podcast that are far more educated and eloquent and experienced at that approach. And so I'm going to encourage you, the listener who hasn't uh, listened to that type of podcast or follow that kind of advice, listen to what Bill has to say. Listen to the people that he has in the program that are the buy and hold and the cash flow specialist. I'm not. What I am is a buy, add value, and sell individual. And that approach must, in my opinion, supplement the buy and hold cash flow approach. And here's here's why. Here's why everyone listening on this program, wherever your demographic is, wherever you live, you know, if you put a, a, the old fashioned, since we're old dogs here, you put the old fashioned compass, grade school compass with the steel tip and a pencil on the other end, and you drew a five mile radius around you and that the compass was inserted into your house where you live right now. You drive a you draw a five mile radius around where you live right now. You know your real estate market. 
you can learn your real estate market. If you've lived where you've lived for at least a year, you can go out join or attend, maybe don't even join, jo attend a real estate investment club in your area and, and, and get in your car and drive around and, and, and look for the common sense telltale signs of distress. Two weeks of uncollected newspaper, two months of uncut grass, broken screens, you know, broken windows, a mailbox is tipping over. You can spot a distressed piece of real estate without having a real estate degree or even reading a real estate book. Now, you, you you're you're probably better off, I would say, if you're a, you're of the conservative bent to buy and hold and, and, and go for your cash flow. But if you can find a distressed first time home buyer house in that within that five mile radius, and I'm saying the five mile radius because you know your neighborhood, you know your market. It doesn't take long to learn it if you don't know it because you live there. I advocate buying one of those. Getting a realtor involved and making sure that you know that you're not overpaying for it, making sure that, A, a that you know – I'm going to digress for a second. My book, Burst This, Frank McKinney, Burst This, exclamation point. Frank McKinney's Bubble Proof Real Estate Strategies talks all about how to do that, how to find that house where you have – you bought, you make your money in real estate the day you buy, not the day you sell. So using a simple $100,000 equation example, if you buy a piece of real estate for $0.60 cents on the dollar, you do a little paint-up fix-up with $0.05 cents on the dollar, you've got sixty-five grand into a $100,000 property, you put it on the market for $100, you sell it for $95, you subtract out your closing costs and your over-budget stuff, you're basically going to make ten dollars to $15,000 on a flip like that. That's good supplemental cash flow. To, and I do consider that cash flow. If you do a couple of a couple of those a year, to use to 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 f do what Bill just said, you know, help somebody out on a down payment, make your quality of life better, you know, support a charity, in addition to your buy and hold strategy. And if you're in that kind of demographic, mind you, you're you're going to be lucky if you generate you know three to four hundred dollars a month positive cash flow after paying off you know your mortgage and your maintenance and your broken toilet stuff on your apartment building or your apartment complex or your apartment unit $15,000 per and we're talking about first time home buyer stuff here we're not even getting into the higher price point for those of you who have a little money i i strongly encourage you to dabble in both and guess what will happen you'll discover what you're best at so frank mckinney is best at buying adding value and and selling that artistry and I did it with a hundred thousand dollar house, and I've done it with a fifty million dollar house. That's just what I do, and I'm really good at it. I'm not excited by, nor probably would I be very good at the buy and hold. But you can have both. You can do both, even if it's one flip a year. You've added fifteen thousand dollars in income to your to your portfolio. That's a great point. Uh, there's a guy we had on uh, that actually lives uh, where I do in Orange County, Southern California, and. Uh, he, you know, he's he's a broker. He's got his broker's license, and uh, he has been uh, flipping. He, you know, I don't know, probably forty years, and he just goes to the the courthouse steps. He buys these undervalued properties, fixes them up, and and generally makes anywhere from forty to to hundred k, uh, depending on the property. And um, he used to just do one a year. Now he's up to like you know four or five of them a year. He doesn't really do a lot of. Uh, regular real estate stuff anymore. I mean, as far as a broker is concerned, but uh, he does a tremendous business. And uh, then that's here in this overpriced Southern California market. So I, I know from his example that uh, what you're saying is very true. And he holds on to some and he invests them in buy and hold properties too. And so he, you know, he has kind of a combination of both and he uses that money to, to buy new properties. Here's why I, I like it. And, and, and again, I'm very biased and, and I have nothing bad to say about a buy and hold strategy just like your friend does a little bit of both the 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 the, the basically the 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 project driven approach meaning there's a start date and an end date i it contributes to my quality of life i will never get a call about a toilet being clogged i will never get a call from my property manager saying the roof is leaking i i i, I now i don't renovate I, I used to i don't renovate much but i i i build from the ground up I, it's a brand new house. It does have a warranty, so I do get a warranty call every now and then, but I set aside money for that, and I, we take care of our warranty calls because that's where my reputation is built. But but I love 
the quality of life issue where where you know we design we put a shovel in the ground and and I have nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with renovating and flipping at all but there is it's it's date specific there's a start date there's a duration and there's a get out date and at our age at our age it's kind of nice knowing that my my exit strategy even though it might take some time to sell these houses if I chose to be without inventory for a while and travel the world and not you know, not worry about uh, rental properties. And again, no, you don't have to worry about rental properties. You've got a good management in place and you got somebody to take care of it. But just for me knowing, and I have in the 20 some years, I've been without inventory for a year or two at a time. And it has allowed me to focus on Haiti and some of the other, you know, my, my writing my books and things. And I just kind of like that. You know, I, I like knowing that if I want to shut the spigot off, and just you know, bank the money and 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 not have to worry about you know a broken toilet. It's 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 just a quality of life issue for me. God, that's great. That's great. Well, what would you say is is really ahead for you in your long term? You know, just looking at your business, where do you want to see it go? This micro mansion concept has it's it's like Madonna reinventing herself. <laughs> you know, I mean, I I can't tell you how excited I am. After doing one thing, really one way, or, or or building towards, you know, going from a sixty or six hundred square foot house all the way to a thirty thousand square foot, square foot house, I designed a house that was seventy two thousand square feet that we actually sold the land before I put a shovel in the ground. I, you know, so that thing is that there will not be a bigger house with more bedrooms, bathrooms, and, and garage spaces. This micro mansion concept, watching the evolution of the high end buyer really take this tectonic shift towards more houses and more places around the world. Yes, check that box. They do have a house in the south of France, the Italian Riviera, Malibu, Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Hawaii, and Palm Beach. So they got five or six of them. Not everybody, but they do have them in more places, and, and Bill, are staying in them less time. So, right, they have to. It makes sense. They have too many houses, and they're using less of the house. So so about a year ago, I, I, I had seen enough of this trend. I wanted to get ahead of the trend, actually, and this micromanagement. If you go to my webpage, my website, frank-mckinney.com, you can take a, a – fascinating video tour, both narrated by me and then one showing the house at night that's not narrated, of a house that is smaller than some bedrooms I've built. Is that amazing? That's I, have built, I, I built uh. a bedroom at 4,100 square feet. That was the biggest bedroom I ever did. The average house in America is 2,230 square feet. This house under air is 3,000 square feet and has a total square footage of 4,087. So, yes, I built bedrooms bigger than this house, but I am so excited about this concept that we've actually bought another lot on the ocean. And just to put it in perspective for those of you who are into numbers, this next one will be a little bit bigger, a little over 5,000 square feet, probably closer to 6,000 square feet, uh, which still is very small compared to what's being built on the ocean. But we'll put a $20 million asking price on it. That That is over $3,000 per square foot. Th- that That is stratospheric, and that is very, <laughs> wow. that is very exciting for me. Man, oh man! Uh, so you've uh, you've got some things ahead of you, definitely that uh, uh, are going to keep you occupied. It's really interesting, though. Most people go big. You're going small, you know. But uh, but you're doing small. but you're doing it in a big way. <laughs> yep, so. it's it's it's, a, it's more of a rebranding, and it's it's really taking advantage of a, a, a shift before it's completely the shift's completely been made. Oh, that's cool. Well, uh, um, we're kind of getting near the end of our, our time here and I, I, I don't want to go over I want to respect your time here but uh, man I, I tell you I could talk to you for a long time especially once we get into Haiti but uh, I uh, we have a session right now sort of near the end of our interview that we call our wrap it up session and I ask you a series of quick questions and uh, try to get uh, answers from you that uh, will help provide resources and information for those listeners out there that are always looking for good stuff so if you're ready I'll go ahead and start asking Asking these questions. Uh, you ready, Frank? Fire away. Okay. Favorite real estate book? I, I have to go back to the original Art of the Deal. I'm not going to be corny and talk about my real estate books. They're great, but but really the one that, that influenced me was, was that way, way back. Yeah, I actually have been listening to it on audio just uh, just the last couple of days, and uh, man, it's been a long time since I've uh, read that, but uh, there's some good stuff that's definitely applicable. Great. Favorite business book? Here's, here's going to throw your, your listeners for a loop. Read 
Charlie and the Chocolate Factory <laughs> from a marketing standpoint. You can you can overpay for a piece of property. You can overimprove a piece of property. You can make up for a multitude of sins if you know how to market. And Charlie and the Chocolate Factory from a marketing perspective it's one of the people I aspired to emulate ever since I was a child, and I do so. If you go to our website, you'll see kind of how we, we present our properties to market. It's very theatrical. Read. it's a, it, You can read it in a night. It's a thin little book. The movie's one thing, but the book by Roald Dahl is one of the best marketing books ever written. Oh, that's great. That's great. I love it. I love it. I, I can't think of the golden ticket. You must have a golden ticket somewhere on these uh, these mini ma- micro mansions. I, I do. <laughs> I, I've, done, I've done stuff like that. But if you think about the exclusivity that he created, the desire he mm. created, the buzz he created over this chocolate, but th- take that and, and, and have it be your real estate or whatever your product is. You know, just the eccentricity that he took to his, the theatrics that he took to the performance. You know, everybody, that whole town was going crazy trying to get chocolate bars but if you really peel away just the entertainment factor of the story and get into the marketing lesson it's brilliant it's sure brilliant <laughs> That's great. i love it i love it uh, how about your most valuable website for success uh i'll i'll tell you i i subscribe to a service called read it for dot me basically read it for me but you put the dot before the me and it takes the best books, business, any kind of personal growth books, it could be spiritual books, they read them for you and they put them either on audio, video, or you can you can read the summary in, in a, like a nine to 12 minute summary. I get one in my inbox every morning and I can go to the library and choose whatever genre, whatever, you know, if I wanna do a marketing book, if I wanna do a self-help book, an innovative book, you know, sales book. I love read it for dot me. That's great. I never heard of it. That's a that's a new one for me. Excellent. How about uh, do you have a favorite app? Oh, let's look at my phone here. Um, <laughs> we have a favorite app. I like the weather app. <laughs> <laughs> I like weather. I like a closet closet weather man. Uh, you know, not really. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not too. I mean, I have that's a phone. Okay. I use it. That's all right. I like the weather. I like, and I like my stock. You know, checking my stocks and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> How about a favorite quote? Exercise your risk tolerance like a muscle. Eventually, it will become stronger and able to withstand greater pressure. Ooh, that's great. Uh, who's that by? Do you know? Me. <laughs> <laughs> very good. That, that's in my book, Make It Big, my very first book. My, the, there's 49 chapters in that book. That is one of the chapters. It is the most popular chapter in out of all my chapters in all my books. Which book Exercise. is it? It's called Make It Big, 49 Make it. Secrets for Building a Life of Extreme Success. Great, great. And then here's our, we always have our apocalyptic question at the end here is, if you lost everything, I mean everything, and all you had left was just one thousand dollars in cash. What would you do with that one thousand to rebuild what you had before? I don't think I'd rebuild it. I think I would go to the uh, the streets of of South Florida where the homeless live that I'm very connected with, and I would take my last thousand, distribute it to as many homeless people as I could, and I would probably live amongst them. Wow. That's pretty. Uh, that's pretty. I wouldn't humbling. have any desire to rebuild it all over again. I would just. I would just say, you know what, God, thank you for what you've given me. I am. I'm. I'm in. I'm in gratitude for the struggle that I'm. I'm enduring out here. Uh, I, I had a great run, a 30-year run. I love the 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 lowliest of those who you put on this earth, and I'm going to spend the rest of my days with them. Ah, uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, Frank, we're at the end of, end of the road here, and really, I think it's been a great, uh, a great interview. Excellent wisdom, and just a, a lot of practical stuff in there too that I think folks will really grasp on to. Uh, how can people find out more about you? Find you know maybe if they even wanted to contact you, uh, uh, what would be the way that that people would go about doing that? I, I think the most entertaining thing you can do that won't cost you a dime, and you can do it in you know in the anonymity of your home or wherever you are, go to frank-mckinney.com. 
On that, my website, is, make sure you put the hyphen between my first and last name or you'll go to a dentist website, frank-mckinney.com. <laughs> you can see some of these beautiful houses we built on the ocean. You can visit the villages we're building in Haiti via the videos that we've taken there. You can read sample chapters from all five of my best-selling books. You can see where I'm going to be speaking, what, you know, on what topic because there's four different genres I've written about. Uh, this micro mansion, you can visit and tour that. So there, there's just a lot of uh, interesting stuff that's all free on there. If you decide to buy a book from us, by the way, a $25 book, let's say, that's 250 meals I can provide to our orphanage in one of our you know, 21 or 24 villages that we've built. So you know, I don't make any money from our books. All the proceeds go to our Caring House Project Foundation. Uh, if you want to come to Haiti with me sometime, there's a there's a link on my website to, to travel to Haiti with us and what's required to do so. So frank-mckinney.com for, for entertainment, for education, and just for some for some fun. Just a final word maybe on the Caring House Project, too. You just kind of touched on it, but I, I think it's it's great stuff you're doing out there. Well, you know, we talked about the professional highest calling. Everyone on this call, uh, on, on this podcast, also has a spiritual highest calling. And, and fortunately for me, after, and we, maybe we could do a whole other podcast on, on this, Bill, but I, I had reached the pinnacle of success maybe 15 years ago, but I was very depressed. Is this all there is? I, I had a garage full of cars and a closet full of clothes, but I, was, I had a soul with no heart in it. And, and I, I realized that I had a spiritual highest calling that I had been neglecting. And so we built self-sufficient villages in the poorest country in the world, that being Haiti, well, Western Hemisphere, depending on what ranking you look at, but it's a poor country. And, and you know, you've lived there. We, we build these self-sufficient villages where we combine housing, a community center that has a school, a clinic, and a church in it, renewable food, clean drinking water, and some form of free enterprise so the, vill the village can be self-sufficient. That's what our Caring House Project does. It allows me to dovetail my professional highest calling, what I do for a living, build these houses for the rich people. And like a modern day Robin Hood, I get to take the proceeds along with my donors, you know, donations, and we go to Haiti and we build these self-sufficient villages. Caring House Project can also be visited when you go to frank-mckinney.com. Ah, great. Wow. Well, Frank, uh, this has been uh, just a blast. I'll tell you, just some, some great stuff, uh, just great stuff that you've shared with us uh, today. And can't thank you enough for coming on. I think uh, there's a not only a lot of meat there for those that are they're looking for the the real estate stuff, but I think there's there's a, a bigger message, and that is really just at the core of who we are and what we do and why we do it. And I think that that's uh, that's to me is uh, is really what it's all about. That's uh, that's great. I I just totally appreciate that, and thank you for coming on. Well, you can, you can spend 45 minutes t trying to teach people how to succeed in the business of real estate, but the more important business we all need to f f succeed in is the business of life, and and, and that's, that's really where you hop over happiness and you land on joy, and that's where I implore you to find that spiritual highest calling because we're all focused on that professional highest calling. I mean that's the whole concept of your podcast really is to – you know how do we as old dogs, how do we make money in real estate? But once you make a little money, then – what are you going to do with it? You know, where does the quality of life come in? And, and that's where the spiritual high school, I know we're running out of time. But anyway, thank you, all you old dogs and some of you young dogs. I'm, I'm honored to have made it to an old dog program. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Frank. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I also want to thank all our old dog listeners out there for joining us. I, I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to, to join us means a lot, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, please note everything that uh, Frank talked about today, including all the links to his website, the books, the you know everything referenced here that will be detailed in our show notes, which are available at olddogsreinetwork.com. So uh, make sure you, you you go there and go in the blog section, and uh, you'll uh, you'll be able to get, get all the all the details. So don't worry about it if you didn't get to write something down. You're on the road or whatever it is uh, listening to this. Uh, we got it all there for you. So that's the show for today. Uh, remember, cash flow is king. Real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.